This morning we want to speak on the, the topic of warning signs of spiritual dying. The Christian can get into a place where they feel their spiritually, their relationship, I mean, with the Lord is dying. Their, their desire to go on with God is waning. And they backslide, they fall away, or they die in spirit. They start to feel and think different than, differently than being in the place with God and rejoicing in Him and loving Him. And so we want to look at Morning signs of spiritual dying this morning. Our reading is in Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read the first nine verses. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, And whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I know the Lord will bless his reading this morning. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we have gathered round the cross. We've gathered in spirit and in remembrance of your son and all that he has done for us. We thank you for the blood that he shed. We thank you that we are saved who know him and have placed our full hope and trust in him and all that he has accomplished at Calvary. We thank you, Lord, you even see us as righteous because we wear the righteousness and bear the righteousness of Christ. And so, Father, we pray in Jesus' name this morning that you would speak to hearts, you speak to men and to women this morning and maybe some are waning in spirit and waning in their life and their walk with you. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would move upon them and Lord, that you would strengthen them, even as it was saying that you would quicken the smoldering embers and cause them to burst into flame that they may burn brightly for Christ. So take thine own word and wing it to our hearts, we pray. And if there's one who's come this morning not yet saved and born again of your spirit, not yet washed in your blood by faith, We pray, O God, this morning that you would draw them close to him by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you would save them for time and for eternity. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our reading from Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, Paul is asking the Galatians, what happened to you? What happened to you? You see, the Galatians were turning away from Christ. And these Galatians were really Israelites. That's why he speaks of the law and circumcision. And some of them got saved, you see. And he says, why would you go back to law, to Judaism or the the, the Judaizers? Why go back to law when Christ has set you free? Why go into bondage when Christ has brought you into liberty by faith? Why try for your own righteousness and the keeping of the whole law when it is Christ and his righteousness and he kept the law that you couldn't keep? And hence that's it in a nutshell, but we'll look at it this morning. And Paul is asking, what happened? So our text was, is from verse 7. You did run well, he asked them. 
Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? There is the crux of this. They did not obey the truth of the Word of God. Claim to know Christ. Claim to be saved by sovereign grace. Now turning away to the law. And he says, listen, who has taught you this? Who has hindered you? What has come into your life that you're turning away from the Lord onto works again? And you know, we could say that of many of us even throughout our lives. Where we can come to a point in our walk with God where we think it's all about our doing even and does God still even love me or want me and we we can look to and we should walk well don't get me wrong but we look to doing better as in the sense well God will be more pleased with me or God will keep me if I do better but God loved you gave a son for you and God keeps you in spite of you not because of you should we repent of our sin absolutely yes And walk therein that we would walk righteous before God. Absolutely yes. But some Christians find it difficult, find it so hard, even if I can use the word unbelievable, that they will get over the hurdle they've been through. They could be forgiven the failures they've had. And hence it hinders them. It hinders their walk with God. And so this morning we're going to look at Warning signs of spiritually, spiritual dying where spiritually sometimes we feel that deadness in our heart for so long. Now before we go any further, I want you to know that we all go through seasons. We all go through periods and times or one day is better than the next sometime. It's not about our feeling. It's about our faith. Even in the days when we don't feel, it's always our faith. And we all go through, uh, sometimes we go through motion, the motions of things. And what do we do? Because we, there's things that would hinder us in our life. There's things that we have allowed in our lives. There's things that we have even done in our lives. And sometimes as Christians now, it hinders us. Knocks us off course nearly. And you wonder, well, I'm already off the track. I'm ever going to get back on it again. Would God even accept me again? We want to look at some of these things, God willing, this morning. So Paul's writing to the Galatian believers here. In verse 1, he reminds them. Notice what he says in verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So he starts reminding them of liberty. We want to look at this first. Because there's many Christians who have took this word and ran with it and found themselves in circles uh, where the liberty uh, uh, goes away beyond past what the word means. And then when they're disappointed with this liberty, so-called, and uh, if you want, uh, charismatic access, and when they realize it's all fluff and stuff, it's all all, uh, carnality and, and flesh, It's all hype and feeling. And when they don't feed it, and when their flesh isn't satisfied, and when it's too light and the word isn't isn't in them, it's all about how we can make the atmosphere great and how we can turn down the lights and, you know, have the darkened rooms and put out the smoke machines and all. And all of those things. And people in sincerity go to these places and they think it is worship here where the, the music is basically... Uh, Christianized rock, heavy rock music. But the problem is, is when it really comes to the nitty gritty, when the rubber hits the road, when the trouble comes to the life, when they shut the door and they're by themselves, they're on their own, what next? They're empty. They're lost in the sense where they don't know how to get through this. The man and the woman who are scripturally stable scripturally grounded, will always have their troubles like everyone else, but they will turn to the bedrock of their faith. And that will bring them through. Unfortunately, there's some places where the word is very rarely even preached. Even sermonettes are given to tickle the ears and to pat their back, to make them feel better. In other words, to pump up their tires before they go home, they're not too flat. I'm not saying we shouldn't encourage one another. We should. 
And I'm not saying that we should beat one another over the head, especially from the pulpit. We shouldn't. But what I'm saying is, is Paul is saying, look, the, the, the word liberty, Christ has set us free. And what did he set them free from? Set them free from Judaism, uh, the, the, the synagogism, rabbinical teaching. Set them free from all of it. Points them to Christ. Points them to the cross. And he says, why would you even think of going back to that? It's bondage. So hence, this morning, we may not be exactly the same as they are here in the sense where we go to Judaism and that sort of a thing. But in a sense, we have so many things, even ritualism in church means nothing before God. And I told the people on Friday night, there's things that people all over our country and their religion and their, their background and they lean to, they look at and they trust in nearly. And God is not impressed with it whatsoever. And that which, pardon the expression, the impresses the Father is the blood of His Son. It's the cross work of His Son. And hence, Christ encounters tabernacle this morning. And whoever is watching, hence we want to be word-based, word-focused. Because, and I love worship, don't get me wrong, and that last hymn, I, uh, that new hymn that, that Rebecca taught us is beautiful. And you could sense the spirit in the meeting, but when I go home, this experience is over, as it were. And I go home, if there's only me and him, it's this that matters. It's this what touches, strengthens, blesses, encourages, and directs my steps and my heart. Notice here, Paul's saying about this word liberty, stand fast, therefore. In other words, he's saying, be strong in it. And what Christ has done in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul's saying, don't move from it. And in this, what I've said, this introduction to where we're going, we'll maybe do two weeks on this. I'll see how I get on this morning. And in this introduction of where we're going with this message is Paul is saying, you know, you go back to things that basically God is not impressed with. God's not impressed with the temple worship. God's not impressed with the animals that are slain and their blood that is shed. He's no longer impressed with that at all. He's impressed with his son. And there is our foundation, brothers and sisters. And stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free. And then on the other side of, if you want, the, <clears throat> the, the church word, if I can call it that, you've got the hyper, uh, hyper charismania. And then the other side, you have the dead duck society. And there's no spirit in the meeting. There's no spirit with them. There's no fruit of the spirit, let alone the giftings of the spirit. So liberty, we must look at it. What is liberty before we go further? Paul says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The word liberty is the word eleutheria. And it means a license. Stand fast, therefore, with the license Christ has given you. Now, if we take it even, you have a license to drive a car. That doesn't mean you can go flying and breaking every speed limit. And you can go flying and run up the curbs and chase people off the curbs when they're walking up the street. That doesn't mean you can do all of those things or you can drive recklessly. You're at liberty with the license to drive the car. You've been given it to do. But there's boundaries to be had. And hence we see that license or this word liberty, it, it's not to do as one pleases. We can do as we please for we have the liberty of God and all this sort of stuff. I'm going to look at this this morning just for a moment. And, and, and that's not what it means. 
True liberty is living as we should, not as we please. So true liberty is living as we should and not as we please. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if you will, please. 2 Corinthians 3 and... Let's write on down to verse 12, please. Paul says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. But their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. Paul is now saying about, he's starting, this is talking about them being brought into liberty. We'll go on in a moment. And Moses when he was up the mount, came down and he wist not the skin of his face shone and the people seen it and he put a veil over his face. And Paul's taking this and saying, that veil, he says, uh, the old, the old uh, covenant is done away. The old covenant is done away and the liberty we have is we are free from the curse, not free from the law, from the curse of the law. It's a big difference from the curse of the law. And hence Paul is saying, listen, Moses had this restriction of this veil. Notice what he says then in verse uh, 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, turn to the, Lord the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Eleutheria. That's the same word that Paul uses to the Galatians in Galatians 5 and 1. Stand fast in the liberty where Christ hath made us free. And this is the exact same word. And what Paul is saying is, even to the, his day, he says there are those and have a veil over the heart and it's covering the glory of God. This, these Judaizers, if, uh, what most of the Greek scholars call them, like Kenneth Woost and others, these, these Judaizers, he says, they, they still have this veil over the heart. And it needs removed. And he's saying, but Jews had the veil removed. You realized that salvation was in Christ. You trusted in his finished work. You believe in the precious blood. You have his Holy Spirit. Now, why, you, why on earth would you go back there? church. So Paul is bringing this out to them and he uses the word liberty. Now, I don't know how many churches you've been. I haven't been around many churches from we have opened here. But I used to go around to different meetings during the week when I wasn't a pastor and, you know, see what they were like. And on a regular basis, if there was a more charismatic meeting, this verse was bandied about and sang about until you know, it was like, a, it was just like as if it was nearly non effect anymore. And it says, now this, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. See, brothers and sisters, there is liberty in Christ. And I believe in life in the church. So don't get me wrong, you know that. But people take it to an access. And they take it so far that it isn't the Lord. It's chaos. It's madness. We sing about it. Take note of this. Moses had the liberty to unveil his face in the presence of God. Notice, when Moses went into the tabernacle, he took his veil off his face but yet it was on outside. You know the church done the opposite there whenever the whole pandemic was going. Everybody done the opposite. Everybody put their mask on when they come in. Not here now, but everywhere else did. Isn't that right? Moses took his mask off when he went in.
And he had liberty before God. So Moses, uh, and if you want to read about more of that, by the way, Exodus 34 will tell you where you can find more about that. We'll not turn to it this morning. So he could take the veil off his face, as it were, in the presence of the Lord. And we in the new covenant, we can, as it were, come with no veil, with liberty. This is the word, liberty, before him without restrictions. This speaks of liberty due to our relationship with God through the blood of Christ. These Galatians are thinking, well, maybe the blood doesn't do it all. Brothers and sisters, we want to say something because I was talking to someone about this during the week. See the blood of Jesus, the cross work of Jesus. See when a man or a woman gets saved. When a man or a woman gets saved. That man and that woman are at liberty. They're set free from their sin. But listen, they're set free. Not only from their sin, but see all this about generational curses and all. That's all, anything like that has broken off them. A Christian can't be a Christian saying they're filled with the Holy Ghost and yet at the same time filled with another spirit. You're either saved or you're lost. You're Christ or you're not. And yet it's rife across our countryside. See, when I got saved, the Holy Ghost came in and the devil went out. The devil went out. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21. Listen to what John says. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Notice, if your heart condemns you, now looking at how so many Christians think, well, I've went too far, I've been away too long, of, I haven't been good enough, and all of this stuff, and condemnation sets into them. Especially when you go and you hear these things about liberty and all of this sort of stuff, and this, these groupings start to say things like, well, you know, you've got another devil in you because you let him in and all this sort of stuff. And you, See, if you're a believer, you need to walk away from that. I know there's people going to hate me saying that out there, but if you're a believer, you need to stop that right now. You need to tell them if you're a believer, listen, I've been washed in the blood. I've been born of the Spirit. I belong to Christ. I am a child of God. And don't go back to somewhere that will teach you that. Notice, if you will, brothers and sisters here, John writes, for if our heart, that's your heart personally and mine, Condemn us. God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Oh, how would you ever accept me in your presence? I haven't spoke to you all week, Lord. Knowing your heart condemns you. Lord, I haven't, I haven't even hardly read half the week. Oh, hi. Lord, I haven't, I haven't worshipped at all or haven't this out or the other or I have done whatever. Now, brothers and sisters, that might be your heart. God knows all about your heart. And you can condemn you. Your heart may condemn you. And maybe you feel that I can't go on with God. Now, I want to stop you there and put the brakes on here. God's greater than your heart. God is greater than your heart. The blood is more powerful than your sin. The blood is more powerful than your sin. God is greater than your heart. And God says, yes, you can come to me. Come in repentance. Come into his presence. Listen, maybe you've fallen. And I mean fallen, because we all fall in some shape or form. But maybe you've fallen, you've fallen quite badly. Maybe you've given your testimony away and you've let yourself down. Well, here's the thing, maybe you have. But he still loves you. He's still your father. And you can come into his presence again and plead the blood of Jesus. I believe today the blood of Jesus 
will never lose its power. For you and for me, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from... Shout it out. Shout it again. Is that even your sin? Is that even how bad you've been? Is that even your sin personally? Yes, it is. All sin. Now, you know I'm not saying we should walk in an open course of sin. You, you know I, I believe we should walk, right? But we all have our failures and we all live in grace. So thank God for his grace this morning. I was talking to someone at the mission and this woman came to me and she said she was aggressive, very aggressive. And the people there were lovely, by the way, but this one person was very aggressive. And she was there every night. And apparently she came from a Protestant background, married into a Catholic family. And... Well, don't want to give too much away, but she, uh, her family had nothing more to do with her. And they were professing Christians. And she was so angry about this. And, but she started bringing it up about sin that no one knew that she had. She says, Will you, would you ask me all of my sins? I said, there's two things I need to know of you. And I said to everyone here, there's only two things that I need to know of you. And I said there, one is, are you a danger to yourself? And secondly, are you a danger to someone else? She said, no on both accounts. I says, then you bring that to God and not to me. I'm not your priest. And this, she started to soften. Asked me about well, what do you think of abortion? I says, I'll tell you what I think of abortion. I think it's murder. And I think it's a horrible sin. It's an abomination before God. I says, because that's God's word, but it doesn't matter what I think. It's what the word says. She says, well, what would you say if a woman had an abortion and came to you? I said, I'd try and help her. I'll tell her she'll be forgiven. I would say that the Lord would still love her. She could have a new start in life. Give her life to Christ. She says, well, what if she said she had a whole lot of abortions? I says, I'd say the same again. So these are the sort of conversations we were having. And this woman was living more for whatever it was in condemnation. She says to me, well, what do you think of the LGBT community. I says, it doesn't matter what I think. I says, but the word of God says that they're living in sin and it's wrong. It's an abomination before God. My thoughts aren't important. I says, what the word of God says is important. He says, well, what if someone came into your church? I says, would say, hello, you're very welcome. Now listen to the gospel. I says, do you believe that a heterosexual person should be living in sexual immorality, claiming they're a Christian or a non-Christian? She went, well, No. I says, well, neither should they. And God can change a man and a woman, hetero and homosexual. And it got down to nearly the nitty gritty of it all. She was so close. And then she sort of stepped back and realized where she was. And then he got right down to the nitty gritty of things. And I said, listen, before you go home, don't let other people, especially other Christians who have professed to know Christ, shouldn't be happening. Your hurt shouldn't have happened. Caused her, she says, I grew up going to church and here and living in Christian family and all this. I says, don't let people who have hurt you keep you away from heaven. She said she would think about this before she went. John says, if our heart condemns us, let's be honest, whoever goes into the presence of God and you've done wrong, you've said wrong, or you've opened your mouth when you shouldn't have, and all of these sort of things. And when you go into there, you, you feel the condemnation in your heart. 
Who's ever done that? I have. All of us have. And God knows all about it. And it's, it's not living in that state, but bringing it to, because here's what happens. This is a sign when we don't, this is a sign you're starting to spiritually wane and die. But God in his conviction is not condemning you. In the conviction, he's saying, get right with me. Offload this son, daughter. Bring this before me. Get it under the blood. And move on from it. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence before God. In other words, we feel the liberty. There's a condemning heart and there's a confident heart here. A condemning heart and a confident heart. So the word here for confidence is the word we have confidence toward God. Parousia, and it means we have freedom in speaking. Ah, Well, sure, we can all speak. No. The idea is that you come as a child of God And when you come before him, you have that knowledge of you and he are okay. You're in talking terms. Freedom in speaking. And maybe this morning you thought, well, my heart's condemned me again. I'm tired of my heart condemning me. Well, you need to get before God and bring it to him and he'll forgive you. And then forget it and move on. If you have to put something right, go do it. But forget what you've done or your lack of, and move on in God. See, if everyone was honest in here, including this man, if everyone was honest, if the Lord was the mark iniquities, not one of us would stand. If he was the mark our iniquities. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And this word here, parousia, means boldness or freedom of speaking. And this is used again when Paul speaks of him, or Hebrews 4 and 16. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And the problem is when people don't realize God will forgive you from an honest, repentant heart and you can move on. They don't realize it and they get further away and they stay away and the length of time away gets longer. And until they're all almost or else all together backslidden in their heart and mind. Backsliding doesn't happen overnight, you know. Comes in increments. So notice this. Paul says that we are to stand in that liberty. Where Christ has made us free. We are to stand saying, I'm a child of God. God is my father. Jesus is my saviour. The Holy Spirit lives in me. I belong to him. I'm forgiven of my past. The blood will still cleanse me from all of my sin when I come and place in repentance before God. Just a, turn with me please to chapter th- to uh, Galatians, fa- chapter three, pardon me, Galatians three. I'm just going to run across a couple of things here. Notice what Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently set forth, been set forth, crucified among you. Paul says the preaching of the cross was as it were in spirit manifested among them. In other words, when the, when the cross and the cross work of Christ and the blood of Jesus is preached under the Spirit and the anointing, Spirit's anointing, he says it's as it's manifest, it's as though you're there under the foot of the cross. And Paul says here, that happened. The Word was told you and the Word was taught you. And that happened. Well, notice what he says here. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? So the Galatians are bewitched in chapter 3 and in verse 1. In chapter 5 
and in verse 1. The Galatians are entangled again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So they're being entangled again. In verse 4, they are fallen from grace. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. You know, whenever you see someone and they, 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 they profess to be saved and they went on for some time or whatever, and all of a sudden you hear they've stopped going on with God, maybe going out, stopped going out to church, they're fallen away, they're maybe in the pub and someone looks at them uh, in the bar, maybe drunk or whatever, and go, boy, he's fallen from grace. That's not really what that means. That's not really what that means, fallen from grace. To say that about someone is more, more taken out of context. Fallen from grace was this, that we are saved by the grace. They were turning to the works of the law for salvation. And so they came away from the grace that was in Christ and the cross of Christ and the blood of Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, all by grace, not by works all by receiving in faith. Nothing that they or we have done. But now they're turning back again to the works of the law. So they've fallen from the grace, salvation, free and full in Jesus. And they're starting, that's fallen from grace. Trying to work, trying to come up the standard. And Paul says these words in verse five. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. So Paul says, in Christ we are righteous. And that is our hope that when he returns, we are found in his righteousness and not in the works of our hands or of the law. So they're bewitched in chapter 3, verse 1, entangled again in chapter 5, verse 1, fallen from grace in chapter 5 and verse 4, and in chapter 5 and verse 7, they're hindered. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? So this was about teaching. Teaching. There's many people even in church and they hear teaching that goes against everything that they heard in the past and they don't realize or even study it to find out whether it be true or not. They just take it for granted. Well, that's what everybody says. That's what everybody does rather than go to the Scriptures and be like a Berean to study the Scriptures to see whether those things be so. So Paul is saying here, you did run well, who did hinder you? So see the word hindered here? It gives the idea to cut off like a runner running. And he's in a race, she's in a race and they're running. And they're coming up near the finish line and someone cuts off in front of them and they start stumbling. And another one comes and cuts in in front of them. It's the idea of this. And Paul is saying, you're walking with Christ. You're walking with the Lord Jesus, he says. And, and now these Judaizers are cutting in in front of you, trying to hinder you to get to the finishing line, trying to slow down and stop your process and progress that is in Christ, your growth in the Lord laying these weights and burdens upon you. Stand in the liberty. Christ has died for me. Christ shed his precious blood for me. Christ rose from the dead for my justification. Christ is my great high priest who has ascended to the right hand of God. Christ is the one who's praying for me. Christ is presenting his blood for me. Stand in that. And forget what everybody else says. Forget it all. Even when your own heart condemns you and tells you you can't. You'll never make it. You'll never be up to scratch. Listen, none of us are up to scratch. None of us are. The only one who ever was holy and harmless and undefiled was the Lord Jesus Christ. Give the children a buzz, please. Thank you. So it means to cut back or to cut off or cut across. You did run well. They're running. 
Next thing, somebody jumps in front of him. Hold on a wee second. Do you not think you should go back to the temple? Hold on a wee second. Are you sure the blood of Jesus is enough now? Hold on. Hold. I, well, sure, that's what I heard. And the cross was preached. It was like I was under the cross itself. I, I could see him by the eye of faith. And, and I received him. He was in my heart. And I could feel him in my breast and my spirit. I, but hold on a minute. Maybe that's not enough. You need to work. You need to do. You need to try harder and go to church more and all of this sort of stuff. You need to go to the temple, they were saying. What about the animal sacrifice? Surely God wouldn't want you or cause you to be saved by one man. People start to fall away. I can't keep this up. I can't keep this up. But see, if you fall in love with Jesus, you're not keeping up anything. You're walking in freedom. You're walking in the liberty. You've got your license. You're going on with God. Listen, it's not hard. I know there's trials and there's tribulations. Can I tell you something, brothers and sisters? Even if you weren't saved, you'd still have trials and tribulations. The only, the only thing is, you've God on your side. You have Christ with you. You have the Holy Spirit in your heart. You've got the Word of God to strengthen you, to lead you and guide you right through it all. And the way I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Isn't that right? Why? Because thou, why? You sure? Because thou, because thou art with me. Some people say, oh, I don't know why I forgive you or not. And people start to show signs of spiritual declension. Signs of spiritual weakness. I was in this church, and that's where it was. But I pastored it. And I've pastored a couple so before here, so you don't know where it is. And this old elder came up to me one time because I had, uh, be careful. I had been speaking and dating with a certain person over their falling away and past lifestyle and they were wanting to, and I knew all about it, but they came to me one time before we went out to worship out the backers or room we had. He says, here, by the way, he says, do you know uh, such and such? I says, yes. Did you know that she'd done this in her life? And he started to tell me what he had found out. And I listened, I went, yeah, I do. And you're still going to let them do something in the church? I said, yes, I am. Maybe you shouldn't. I says, why? Oh, a person like that, like, with a life like that. I said, then all of us may close the door and go home. And he looked at me, what? I says, all of us may just close the door and go home then. If you want to bring up that person's past then, you need to look at your own life first. Even if there were a Christian and it happened, but they weren't. But even if they were, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. Come on, shut it out. Cleanseth us from what sin? All sin. All of it. And your father this morning is saying, don't you even dare think about walking away from me because of failures and faults. Don't you dare think of walking away from me because you don't feel you're up to any good. You're not up to scratch. Don't you dare. You're kept by grace every day. You're never up to scratch, but he is. You'll never pay it, but he did. You're never good enough, but he is. Don't dare measure yourself by yourself or by others. Always look to the freedom in Christ, the liberty, where you stand and born again of the Spirit and washed in his blood, and his blood will never lose its power. The church this morning, this is just my introduction, by the way. So I'm closing with this, okay? Disobedience to God's word is a sure sign of spiritual declension. And you have heard God's word this morning to your heart. If you walk out and disobey it, and you continue to decline, you'll decline further. It's a sign of spiritual declension. Where am I going to start next week? Right there. Yes.